I'm Marshall Trimble, official Arizona State historian. I live in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I'm a native Arizonan. Um, my story is the, of my mother's f side of the family, and um, they were. She was uh, in O'Murphy and um, uh, and Mulvey Hill, and they came over in during the Great Hunger. I'm guessing right around 1847. I haven't been able to uh, do the genealogy on uh, where they lived, but I think they were in Cork. And they left Dublin in 1847 on what was what was called, what would later be called, I guess, or maybe they were called at the time, the coffin ships. I got a chance about two or three years ago to be in Dublin and uh, to take a tour of one of those little ships that they uh, came over on. Well, Mary O'Murphy came over, it was a young girl, and um, and John Mulvey Hill was a young boy, and they 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 did not meet. They, even though they were on the boat, they said they didn't. The, the story is they didn't know each other um, until they immigrated to America, got to America, and um, they they went up. They wound up in St. Paul. There was an Irish community in St. Paul, and so they uh, uh, and then they John John Mulvey Hill when they grew up married Mary O'Murphy. And that was the beginning of, of um, what I know of my family here, my Irish uh, mother's side of the family here in America. And they lived in St. Paul for a few years, and uh, he witnessed a murder uh, in St. Paul, and he was advised to take his family and leave. And um, so he hurried out of St. Paul. He went to Iowa for a while, and I don't know what happened in Iowa, but the best I can tell I had a cousin um, who was um, uh, who, who was uh, from the same union there uh, in Missouri, and he told me the story that um, uh, they, 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 Miss Mary split up with John and uh, went back to Arkansas um, with uh, with her family. Uh, the the Mulvey, the, the Murphys had gone down uh, to Arkansas, so she joined them in um, Arkansas, and. Um, that's where my my uh, my grandmother Mamie was born, and um, so from there uh, they they migrated to uh, Arizona in 1918 for she had tuberculosis, and so Mamie uh, and Mamie had married forgot to say Mamie had married a man named Jerry Shelley, and so she was Mamie Shelley, and she married my uh, grandfather. Uh, whose ancestors were from Tyrone, County Tyrone, uh, and living in Arkansas. So there must have been kind of an Irish community in Arkansas, uh, in northern Arkansas. They were very rural, but um, that was, um, uh, then they came to Arizona, and he was a farmer out in Tempe. And, um, but uh, when my mother was, my mother was born here in Tempe in 1918, and uh, she had an older brother, and um, uh, then Mamie, Mamie Shelley, or Mamie Rogers now, passed away uh, of tuberculosis. And the story is um, that my mother told me was that, um, that uh, they went back, she and her mother went, took a train trip back to, back to Arkansas to visit with family. And on the way back, uh, Mamie, uh, her, Mamie passed away uh, of tuberculosis. And when they they don't know when she died on that trip, on that train ride, but as they were coming back to uh, Tempe, uh, when my grandfather, um, uh, Arthur William Arthur Rogers, went down to the train station, um, my, his wife was dead. And uh, my mother was about four years old, and she was huddled up with her mother, uh, and um, don't know if mom realized she was dead or not, but she rode that all that way just clinging to her mother. And um, so that was um, kind of a tragic story, uh, but tuberculosis was a big, uh, you know, was, was really one of the, the uh, very terrible diseases that brought people and, uh, to Arizona. Native of Arizona and um, uh, Irish, Scots-Irish on my father's side and, um, and the Re Republic on my mother's side. And so uh, I have the orange and the green, and I guess that's why I'm so confused all the time. But uh, that's uh, that's my story. Let's start out. We can start out with my father's side. Um, they came to America uh, from Northern Ireland in um, 1720, and there were five brothers named Trimble, and they landed in Virginia, 
and my part I think they I think they went separate ways then but my 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 side of the family um, uh, stayed in Virginia and remained there up through the Revolutionary War and um, Captain Robert Trimble was um, uh, in the um, Virginia uh, over mountain men they call them the over mountain men and they fought a, a crucial battle at Kings Mountain uh, in uh, North Car South Carolina, right on the border of South and North Carolina in 1780. And so, uh, which really uh, led up to the driving of, of, uh, of the British up to Yorktown where the surrender came. So uh, Thomas Jefferson was governor of Virginia at the time and, and George Washington was a Virginian too. So they had uh, big congratulatory t uh, th things for, to say, very good things to say about the importance of the over mountain men. So that's, that was my involvement with a very historic uh, Irish, Scots-Irish group. And um, they, uh, in, just after the Revolutionary War, they were given uh, land out west, so they went through the Cumberland Gap. And from there, um, I often wondered, did they know Daniel Boone? Probably, but um, because that was a very small, small group of Scots-Irish in that area. And they remained there until 1811, and um, and from there they um, they went on down to what was called Missouri, and uh, about 20 years later it became Arkansas. But they were down on the White River, and the Trimbles were surveyors, and there's they surveyed the land that is today um, Batesville, Arkansas. And uh, then in um, 1830, um, Moffat uh, or Moses they called him Trimble uh, signed on with with um, Jesse Beans. Arkansas Mounted Volunteers, and they become the forerunners of the United States Cavalry. Uh, the Volunteers, along with the Missouri Volunteers, with Nathan Boone, and I believe there was a group from Illinois, and uh, maybe two. But anyway, they were sent out here to, uh, uh, they were mounted on horses, they were sent out here to deal with the Indians, and um, the Plains Indians, because they were moving the, uh, uh, the Eastern tribes, like the Cherokee, the Creek, and Seminole and so forth were, were moving out to um, uh, the west um, and so in, in what was called the Trail of Tears. So they, um, uh, they were not welcomed by the Plains Indians tribes who uh, regarded this area, the Oklahoma and Kansas, as their personal hunting grounds and they did not like. So there was a kind of a, they, they thought, let's form a, um, a United States at that time uh, thought uh, forming a horse cavalry was an elite group, and it would be too much like the British. <laughs> so, so they, uh, uh, so they thought we got to have a mounted group though to go out and make an impression on the Indians. Well, these guys were the ragtag, rough and tumble, uh, just uh, just frontiersmen, mostly Scots Irish, and they um, they did not make a big impression on the Indians because they didn't have fancy uniforms and things like that. So Lewis Cass, the Secretary of War at that time, uh, Lewis Cass said, we, uh, we really, they were out there for a year uh, from Fort Gibson, Oklahoma, riding out, and they didn't, ha they didn't have any warfare, but they really didn't, uh, the, the Indians were seldom seen, uh, but the Plains Indians, it, and it, it really, it was, it was, it was uh, I guess it, it showed the United States government that they really needed a regular professional army. And so in 1832, um, they, they decided to, uh, to um, send the volunteers home, back to Arkansas, Missouri, so forth, and uh, form a, and it was what became known as the first United States Dragoons. And so these Dragoons um, um, went home and continued Indian fighting and things like that and on the frontier, and the United States Cavalry was born. And so uh, the first dragoons became the United States Cavalry. So I was always proud to think that my ancestor had been a, a part of that important historical. Uh, Washington Irving wrote a book about it called Life on the Prairie. And uh, it was, it was a, a tour of the prairie, I believe it was, yeah. And it was, um, and it, it was, a, it was still, still a popular book. And he spent a year riding with the Arkansas Mounted Volunteers and my ancestor, who was a sergeant in the uh, volunteers. So um, after that, uh, about oh, eight or nine years later, um, he's up and gone again. I mean, typical Scots-Irish, he's continually moving west. And um, he goes down to um, uh, San Antonio, Texas in 1840, 
and this was just before the Mexican War, outbreak of the Mexican War, and he joins with the Texas Mounted Volunteers uh, in, in San Antonio, and he has, um, uh, his, his commanding officer was Colonel uh, Jack Hayes, who was a famous Texas Ranger, and um, uh, Sam Walker was uh, the regimental commander, lieutenant commander, uh, under Hayes, and uh, he's the man, the Sam Walker was the one who designed the Walker, famous Walker Colt pistol. And uh, then, then his company commander was William Wallace, um, was, uh, was also better known as Bigfoot Wallace. So he had quite a, it was quite an array of, of Texas legends he had commanding. And they fought at Resaca de la Palma and Brownsville, and um, their big fight was at Monterey. And after that was over, uh, the war pretty much was over, and they came home. And I, I kind of lost track of him after that. But my, uh, but he's, when he came home, he named his first son Sam Walker uh, for, for his commander, and um, Sam Walker Trimble. And he would grow up to be a, a Confederate in the Texas Cavalry in, during the Civil War. And so that's my great-grandfather. The Irish in Arizona uh, have, a, have a colorful history. Uh, they were, you know, the first of them that came over, so many of them came over during the hunger and uh, during the Civil War, American Civil War, and they could gain American citizenship by just joining the army. Uh, and after the war, uh, they, they were building the railroads, working on building the railroads, uh, the transcontinental railroads, and America was just building all these railroads all over the country. And the Irish, um, uh, just seemed to take to that kind of work, that kind of labor, and uh, uh, a lot of their, a lot of their music. They brought a lot of their music with them. That they, it didn't, it didn't fit Ireland anymore. Uh, the, the lyrics to the songs. So they kept the, they kept the music, and they, they took the, they, they took the lyrics to the songs and changed them. And um, like, um, uh, they had one called the, the unfortunate rake, um, or the bard of Bar Armagh, uh, in Ireland. And it was um, when it got over here, um, they, um, they 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 changed it. They, this was a story of a of a man who um, uh, had had an unfortunate uh, contracted an unfortunate social disease from a camp follower. He was a soldier, in, in the um, in the army, and um, uh, so he was. Uh, 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 it, it, the song became known as the Bad Girl's Lament. Well, when it got to it got to uh, down here in in, in the southwest, um, that you you know the lyrics didn't work, and so they they uh, changed it around, and um, and he uh, it become it becomes the streets of Laredo, a famous cowboy song, uh, of of the, the the there was a young I'm I'm a young cowboy and I know I done wrong, uh, kind of a thing is the story and is is one of America's most famous cowboy songs. <laughs> Nellie Cashman and her sister Frances, they called her Fanny, and their mother, left Ireland during the Great Hunger in the late 1840s, and they landed in uh, the East Coast, but they didn't stay long on the East Coast. Uh, they, they, they wanted to go west. It was in their blood, I guess, and uh, so somehow or other, we have different stories on how they got uh, to San Francisco, but um, when they did, um, Nellie and Fanny and, her, and, and their mother decided to open restaurants and they decided to go into the mining, into the mining areas and they opened camps. It started out uh, with a camp in Nevada and, um, and they, uh, it, during the silver mining boom there. And as time went by, um, uh, Fanny, Fanny went back to San Francisco and she got married and being a good Irish Catholic girl, uh, she immediately started a family and she had several children. And then, um, uh, as, as Nellie is making history, working in mining camps, running restaurants and boarding houses and things like that, this is where the real money was for a, for a woman in the mining camps, uh, is um, because, first of all, miners had to eat, and they had to have a place to sleep. And so the women who really prospered here uh, were the ones who opened up boarding houses and restaurants, and that's where Nellie got her money. And she also was grub staking miners at that time, and she would, um, uh, by grub staking a miner, uh, you're loaning them money to uh, buy supplies, and that makes you a partner. And if they strike it rich, you're a full partner, you get half. And if they, if they lose, well, you lost your investment. 
but it was grub staking. That's what grub staking was. So she made a lot of money grub staking miners, and um, and she um, and and she gave it most of it away. She gave it to charitable causes, uh, mostly to the Catholic schools and Catholic hospitals and things like that uh, in in the West. Her travels were take her uh, to Arizona during the great silver rushes in Tombstone, and she ran a restaurant uh, in Tombstone. She ran one in Tucson and several others around Arizona, and she was, had a knack again for making money, and she had a knack again for grub staking miners and doing well, and she was most uh, most loved because she, she she shared her money. She must have given away fortunes in her lifetime uh, for good causes. And if a miner died in an accident, in a mining accident, uh, you can bet uh, Miss Nellie would be out there uh, the next day with hat in hand and going into the saloons and uh, collecting money uh, uh, to, to, take, to give to the mother, I mean, to the, to the uh, wife of the lost miner. Because there were no benefits. If you got lost in the mine, um, uh, your, 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 your wife was destitute and your children. Uh, they, were, they had no money from anybody. They had, to, they had to figure out another way to make money. And so many of these poor women had to become prostitutes. Uh, and others worked in, worked in houses of mining officials uh, for a, uh, to make a living to, bring, to raise their children. Well, let's go back to um, Frances, uh, Fanny, uh, Nellie's sister. Uh, she married a man named Cunningham. Uh, up in uh, San Francisco, and Cunningham um, died of tuberculosis. Remember what I said about tuberculosis? It was, it was, uh, it was everywhere uh, and effect, affected, uh, and so. And then uh, Fanny has it, and so she takes the five children and um, she brings them down to Tombstone, where Annie has, uh, uh, excuse me, where Nellie has a business, and um, she goes in, she goes to work with helping her sister. Uh, and uh, and then Fanny, the tuberculosis gets Fanny, and she uh, and Nellie makes a deathbed promise that she will educate um, uh, Fanny's children and get them all get them all educated. Uh, so as a single woman, Nellie Cashman raises all of these children, and they go on to have prominent commit careers. Uh, the Cunningham children. Her favorite was Mike, and um, I got to know Mike's daughter. Uh, pretty well a few years ago in Tombstone and uh, Mike later became a, a bank president of uh, what is today Bank of America uh, but it was Bank of Arizona then and uh, so he had he had quite a career and all of the all she educated them all this single she was a single woman raising all these kids and uh, but she had made a deathbed promise to her sister um, Nellie will be in Arizona for several years um, and always off trying to find grub stake, trying to find a treasure somewhere. She was a, she, she was just a, a prospector too, and um, loved the just loved the game of trying to strike it rich. And then what she did, she gave it away. She just gave the money away. She goes up then into when the Alaska Gold Rush comes and the and the Yukon uh, uh, rush comes in the 1890s. Um, Nellie's up there into the Yukon. And um, doing the same thing, running a restaurant and um, and business enterprises. She had a real knack for making business. Millie never married. Um, all these years, um, she had these kids to raise, and she never married. She came close a time, one time, at least one time. She was very, very pretty. I've got pictures of her, and um, she was a beautiful girl. And she must have had lots of offers. Uh, but um, in those days, if you married. Um, you sort of became the property of your husband, and um, uh, Nellie did not belong, want to belong to anybody. She was her own. She was. I was going to say she was her own man, but she was her own woman. And so she she said. Um, uh, but people would ask her, say, Nellie, um, you're out there. You're going out there on these gold-seeking prospect uh, prospects, and, and out, out you're out there with six or seven miners, and you're a beautiful woman. And aren't you afraid? And Nellie, with her cute little Irish. Irish accent. She said, um, "If you act like a lady, they will treat you like a lady," and that's how she responded to those. Many times, people ask her if she didn't fear being around those men out there, uh, all alone, you know, lonely men and a beautiful woman amidst them. And there, she, I think she had so much respect. I think she must have been. She, I think they sort of revered her as as if they would a mother superior, and so they didn't. Uh, they, you know, they, she was she was safe. 
Well, up in the Yukon, she becomes a legend, and um, she donated money to build a hospital that's still, uh, uh, it, it's in um, Vancouver, I believe, uh, today. It's either, yeah, I think it's in Vancouver. And anyway, that hospital is still standing today. I don't have my notes in front of me, so I'm just going by you know, right off the top of my head. But um, that was, um, uh, but she, uh, she was up there. She lived the rest of her life up there, uh, mushing the dog sleds and doing good deeds and just, um, and, and ever the prospector. Right up to her dying day, uh, she was a prospector, looking for the next big, next big stake. There were lessons to learn of the Great Famine. There's a lot of myth about the famine uh, because, uh, and the, the thing that bothers me as a historian is that um, uh, Ireland was Ireland was exporting all kinds of goods to England during the uh, during that whole Great Hunger when a million people during those years uh, died of starvation, and a million more immigrated uh, to either maybe Australia or the United States or Canada. And so um, I thought it was. It was a. Uh, this is something that didn't have to happen, and um, and the British. It was a mismanaged thing. The uh, the you had these absentee landlords in Ireland, and uh, property owners uh, that uh, they were they were shipping these goods while people were starving. Uh, they were shipping these goods. So they, uh, I I I I have a hard time saying calling it the Great Famine. Uh, I prefer to call it the Great Hunger, as as they call it in Ireland. Uh, it's called mostly the Great Famine outside of Ireland, and um, but I believe that that uh, but that and the you know the the ownership and uh, the British um, and um, the the just the, the whole thing was mismanaged uh, with with um, uh, with England and uh, to to allow this to happen when they were shipping all of these goods, they didn't have to starve. So they should, they, they should, it didn't have to happen. So I think that's a lesson we've learned from that, and it did, it did change things. I don't know the, all of the history uh, be, behind that, but over the years, because they would have another, they have another potato famine, and I should point out they had potato famines all over Europe at that same time. It wasn't just Ireland having a potato famine. And so um, the the um, uh, it, when it happened again, I believe it was about 1879. There was another famine, and this time uh, there was not nearly the starvation or the problems with starvation. So they had uh, uh, England had learned, learned a lesson. This was um, uh, th this was shame to the English, I think, to let this uh, let the people starve while they were, uh, you know, sending I exporting all these goods um, and, and cows and pigs and and sheep and and um, uh, horses and things back uh, uh, not well for not not to eat but for uh, uh, to, uh, and, and farm products uh, shipping this going to England while Irish were starving and we should learn a lesson in history from that and I think I think they did um, and um, and we have a I think we, the lesson we learn here in the, in America that um, the contributions the Irish made uh, the Irish were treated worse than the African Americans uh, when they came when they immigrated. In fact, um, the the African Americans were paid. They they were bought. Uh, the owner had an investment in them. And I'm thinking of working in the swamps in New Orleans with the alligators and snakes. Um, they used, they put Irish in there to work with the lumber and the swamps and uh, in that uh, because the Irish were expendable. And um, they were the old N I N A. No no Irish need apply. Uh, law rules in Boston and places like that um, in New York and the Irish were treated uh, you know if anybody ought to be demanding reparations today uh, it ought to be the Irish for the way they were treated but they aren't that they they would not they are not the type that ask for reparations they 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 just little by little they got into government they got into police uh, uh, police work and firemen and they took these jobs that maybe other people didn't want to take and in that way, uh, they gained, but they did, most important of all, they gained political power. And, by, and pretty soon they are, they, you know, instead of, uh, in, instead of remaining as they were, they, they didn't settle for it. And um, throughout history, they did, you know, they were able to uh, gain power that way. They overcame, I guess to summarize it, uh, they overcame over all the hardships and, um, and in, and and became a very important part of of the American culture, 
as they are today. They're one of them, they're they're probably the, the, have contributed more than any other immigrant to American culture. And the Scots Irish, uh, for what their contributions were, uh, when they, as soon as they landed, uh, these were clans. They had a clans uh, uh, society, and and they were fighters. And they uh, ever ever westward, and uh, many of the great leaders on the western frontier uh, in in um, in uh, clearing the frontier for other people to come and live, um, all the way to all all the way to the to the west coast, um, were the Scots Irish. And you look at the background of some of these great mountain men, and Kit Carson, and uh, Joe Walker, and and uh, well Andrew Jackson, and people like that. Um, and you find they were Scots Irish, and so um, I had a, 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 a. It's a very proud history of you know, their work in the Revolutionary War and providing military leaders ever since.